to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't, <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. Kyle Kingsbury, my brother. My brother, Aubrey. Yeah. Good to see you here, my man. Here we go. We're not quite six feet apart, but I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not stressed either. <laughs> I am not stressed. So these are, these are times that the world has never experienced. Like never experienced. And when I wrote the Own, Own the Day, and you, know, you were obviously a big part of that and bouncing ideas back and forth, we talked about a day that was going to fit for a world in which you went to work i mean there's optimized practices for your commute to work or even if you work from home and you know that it's a good thing that we put that in there because obviously everybody's working from home now <laughs> but there's just a different there's a different lens in which to look a lot of the principles remain but there's other different elements based on this kind of macro quarantine life which i think this is obviously we're going to get through this at some point but I wouldn't be surprised if this comes back in another way. So uh, the idea here was to try and talk about owning the day from a quarantined perspective. Like, how does that look? How is that different than, you know, what we originally created in the optimized day? And a lot of it is similar, but some of it is different. So I guess the first question for you would be, like, what are the, what are the differences in the practices that you've engaged in now in this kind of new reality that we're in yeah there's there i mean the first thing that comes to mind is structure right and your book is loaded with what is the perfect 24-hour cycle mm -hmm. right and i think for a lot of people who aren't working um they're looking through the lens of well how do i get shit done still right and i did the same thing i'm speaking from personal experience for the first two weeks we're on quarantine. It was like, oh, great. I get to spend time with family. And then it was like, well, fuck, we've got an extended summer where now we're effectively homeschooling. Mm -hmm. So there's that, oh, I have to let go of this thing that isn't here anymore and I have to embrace what is. But, you know, something that I've been talking about to the folks at Fit for Service is we all know kids need structure. If they don't have it, they go out of their fucking minds and they don't mm -hmm. listen to you and they push back because structure allows them with boundaries to play within boundaries and to know themselves with structure. It's no different than like a puppy. If you get a puppy and you let it know that you're the alpha male, not by beating it, but putting it on its back or mm -hmm. just in some way, letting it know that it's safe, you're the alpha male or the alpha dog, it's not gonna attack other people because mm -hmm. it doesn't have to protect you. You're the alpha. Mm -hmm. But without that, the dog grows up and it might bite somebody, mm -hmm. right? So, and then we know adults, they go to work, they have some form of structure. And then the elderly, what do they do when they go to an old person's home? They go into hospice care, they give them a schedule so they can play within the boundaries and feel safe. And we think that skips this giant chunk of the middle of our lives. And it's not fucking true at all. We yeah. all do better with some routine and some schedule. So I think the question for me has been, how can I set that up so that each of us has some direction through the day? We have time to connect with one another and we have time to connect to ourselves because, you know, whether it's conscious loving and you're thinking of things from a, a loving relationship or romantic relationship, all relationships need space. You have space and closeness, spaciousness, proximity. And if you're not like everyone else, you're not feeling much spaciousness right now. You're feeling the proximity of your family. You're feeling the proximity of your kids. Or if you're solo, maybe that's the thing that's missing is, is it's all spaciousness and no proximity, no closeness. Yeah. So the, it's about the balance has been shifted. Mm -hmm. You know, it's either, it's like you said, you're either with your family all the fucking time or you're not with the people that is, are your chosen family, you know, whether it's actual familial genetic bonds or, you know, legally married bonds or whatever, but your, your balance, your ratio is off. Yeah. So I think creating that that structure has been the biggest help for me because 
and, and a lot of it came from this book. I mean, no, not shameless plug or not. It's fucking true. You know, what is the morning routine and what can we do as a family that will optimize us for the rest of the day? Well, the principles are still there. Hydrate, mm -hmm. get sunshine movement, right? So yeah. the practices for us have been to hydrate and we got to yell at bear, you know, like, Hey man, you got to drink your water first thing in the morning. And I'm not yelling, but I mean, it's like, we got to stay on his ass cause he doesn't want to drink water. He wants breakfast, that kind of thing. We'll eat a light breakfast. We'll walk our dog. So we're getting direct sunlight. We're warming up the body. And then every other day we'll swap between morning movement or a workout we hit in the garage and, you know, Tasha's in the third trimester. So she's doing it pretty light. Um, Bear's four years old and knocking out 10 pull-ups in two minutes. So that's cool because he loves that's it. That's unbelievable. <laughs> He'll do 500 meters on the ski erg. Uh -huh. And I'm not pushing him. This isn't trophy kids. This isn't anything fucking weird where I have any kind of delusions of grandeur about him being Michael Jordan or any of that shit. It's just we are fit people. And when you work out in front of your kids, they gravitate towards the thing that you love to do. Sure. And this is a beautiful opportunity for you to do that if you have kids. Mimicry is the way that human beings learn the best. Yeah. And right now, that's they're from third trimester to seven, they're being programmed. So why yeah. not program them with some really healthy things? So Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we'll do that. Sometimes one or two people come over and work out with us in the garage. And then uh, the rest of the week, we're doing yoga on those days. And this is the first week where I've really practice the deload week where I'm not working out. I'm just going to do yoga every single day. And my wife's teacher, Jen Pru, who runs Breathe Los Gatos out in California, she has a yoga I have zero affiliation with them. They're not a sponsor, but it's fantastic. And what I was telling you before the show is her commentary during the sessions has taught me more about what yoga is and, and is really like, it's like any good spiritual book. Like it's giving you downloads while you're in the hard practice of the practice and mm. that is illuminating so much more than just fucking stretching yeah so i mean it's it's filling my cup and i think that's one of the things that i try to instill in people when i have my talks and in tulum especially for fit for service was fill your cup first See, no different than like robert kiyosaki rich dad poor dad he says pay yourself first even before the irs mm -hmm. pay yourself first and the payment is whatever soul medicine you have for yourself Mm -hmm. Right. So if I can unlock my physical body and my physiology through stretching and yoga and I can tie the breath into that and I can find stillness and I can quiet my mind in the practice and I can dip into that flow state, the whole rest, everything I fucking do after that is a cakewalk. If I have emails and shit I don't want to do or shit I haven't been paying attention to and I got to knock out like paying a Texas tag toll, even though I already have the, the Texas tag. Like, why'd you send me a toll? I already have the tag. It yeah. should be auto pay, <laughs> you know, but I got to do that. If it's post yoga, post meditation, post laying in Shavasana, like I'm fucking set. And mm -hmm. every other practice is, has been made better from that as well, from meditation to all of it. But I think that we do have space. The vast majority do have space to think of what does that perfect day look like? And I think that, that you know, everybody talks morning routines, but even if you have a family and sometimes Bear will do the whole yoga class with us. Sometimes he'll draw, but he's having his alone time then while Tosh and I get to do yoga and connect to each other in that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest changes that we've made together is, is dropping into that every day. First thing in the morning, we got our morning routine and then we get to play with bear and ride bikes and all sorts of cool shit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, when I was in the, in the darkness retreat, that was a time where I recognized the importance of structure as well, because you have, you know, six, I was in there six days and there's no light, there's no sound, there's no people, you know, I'm in a dark ass room and like part of sanity was having structure, like, and that meant breath work every single day, sometimes a couple times a day, you know, just going through the Wim Hof practices of the deep breathing and the holds. You know, it's obviously easier when you have good music that fires you up, but nonetheless, in the darkness, you got nothing. So you have to do that. So it's breath work every day, some form of yoga or movement every day, sometimes just dancing alone in the silence and just shaking my body, moving around. Always a cold shower, you know, like always a meditation, like always these things and recognizing that if I can just accomplish all of these things, I'm going to feel you know, like there is some structure to this complete void, you know? And so this is obviously an easier version of that. I mean, I got a great backyard. I got access. The sun comes access, up. The sun comes up. <laughs> I got access to work. I can jump on the phone. Um, but 
keeping some of those elements of practice. Like right before this podcast, I had you put on the new Muse headband that they sent me, which is a, a portable uh, brain sensing biofeedback device that allows you to track your own meditation practice. And that's been super helpful to Larry. And so every day I'm hopping on the Muse and doing my, you know, usually 10 minutes of meditation, something simple, and then just seeing how I'm improving with that practice of like quieting the mind and then doing my either some kind of breath work or some kind of meditation or some kind of ceremony or some kind of workout or um i think it's like like you said it's about figuring out what your structure is in this new world and like what is the time for work what is the time for writing like when is it and i haven't been regimented by like this time has to be here because one of the interesting things is the whole day blends for me because I don't have any family and I don't mm-hmm. have any other other factors. So it's more like a checklist rather than a schedule. Yeah. You know, and that's what I've really found. And, you know, Own the Day, I think, gives you more of a time-sensitive schedule because of the natural factors of typically having your work day or typically having family time, typically having kid bedtime, typically having all of these different things. But for me, I'm in this kind of, wide openness so it's just like all right but i still need the checklist i yeah. still need to go down the list and hit every single thing that i can yeah and there's freedom in that when you can check things off you know ours is a little bit more structured simply because bear's four years old and that right. really helps him but what's cool is if you have just the checklist is all those things are good for you and the more boxes you check the better you feel the more you've accomplished right i think what's important now and if you look at this from like a a global standpoint from a spiritual standpoint as we've talked about and as your friend wrote on medium the beautiful article of what ayahuasca taught me about covid19 maybe you Mm -hmm. can link to that in the show notes ryan yeah azria yeah it's fantastic but like this idea that we have an opportunity first of all we're all forced to go within we're all forced to deal with our families whether that is healing or whether it's The shadow side, which we do see, higher alcohol sales, higher domestic violence, a lot of shit's going on here. Mm. But ultimately, hopefully leading to change, positive change that lasts. And I think if we can provide some shift in from the do-do-do, as we've talked about before, you know, in in Quantum Spirituality by Amit Goswani, it's a fantastic book. Uh, Dr. Dan recommended one of his books, The Physics of God, Mm. which is five hours, phenomenal, on Audible. This latest one, he, he basically, it's like a song. He says, doobie, doobie, do. And so the more times you trickle in being into the day, you allow your conscious mind to take a break and the super conscious or the quantum realm or the God realm, whatever you want to call that, can take over. And the more you dip into that, the, the better the conscious mind works, the more energy you have, and the better your processing power is because you're not just relying on your own computer. You get to rely right. on the worldwide web of the cosmic force that is all right. And anytime we can trickle in those practices from the breath work to the cold tub to any, and if you don't have a cold tub, I get it, but there are things you can do. And obviously we talked about it in this book was you don't have a sauna. You got a fucking hot bath. Most people have a bath and you can scorch yourself in that bath. Yeah, you crank up the totally. heater, right? So there's, there are practices to dip into that practices that are challenging at first that become habit. And in those habits, All of those fill your cup. And I think the most important thing for people now is what are the structures and and boxes you can check off that fill your cup and bring you into a state of being so that the doing is done less but more effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the, the doing should flow from your being rather than the being should flow from your doing. Like I think we get it all all backwards like oh if i'm doing this i'll be this way Mm -hmm. you know so we that's the way we think of it of like oh if i do yoga i'll be you know i'll be in a certain way and in in some ways it 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 can help you know like the act the active process of meditation or the active process of doing yoga the active process of working out or going in cold plunge the doing can help and support the being but if you can get to the state where you're being you'll be drawn you'll be like pulled naturally to the doing that's actually going to be the most supportive of your being and it comes from this place of knowing you're just like ah oh, like i know i need to do this and then it's about quieting that voice of mental resistance 
that always kind of wants to keep you small and shitty and afraid and like in, in, in these kind of unproductive mental states, you know, is what resistance is trying to do. It's trying to keep the ego in the dominant position. But if you can surrender that and really just start to trust your knowing and then just quit the mental debate. You know, that's one thing I talk about in the book is mental override. That's that moment where you're in the shower and you're looking to turn the nozzle cold and you just don't debate with yourself anymore. You're looking at the cold tub and you're just like kind of wobbling around like, am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? <laughs> just you get to the point where you're like, no, this is what I need to do. So I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to put my foot in here and this other foot in here and then I'm going to go in and then you get in and then eventually you sink into it. But the resistance and suffering comes from all of the negotiation we have with ourselves. When we make things negotiable and everything's negotiable because we don't trust ourselves, then that's just not a fun life to live when you're constantly in negotiation about every single thing. Uh, should I should I eat this? Should I do this? Should I do this practice or not do the practice? Uh, well, you know, I'm a little tired. Uh, well, you know, I don't know. Fuck it. Just like do what you know you need to do. Yeah. And it's funny because the the questioning only happens when you're not in a state of being, when you're in a state right. of being, you have the knowing, right? right? And it's definitive. It's just like, okay. And I think things like mental override are really good when you first start out. And it's like uh, Dan John, the great strength coach says, just show up. You don't want to work out today, but today's a day to work out. Just fucking show up. You just show up. And no matter what you do in the gym, it's a win because you showed up. Right. And obviously people aren't going to the gym now, but you walk into your garage and you own one kettlebell or you own nothing and you're doing the on at six, just fucking turn it on and see what you can accomplish with that. Mm -hmm. And if you get 50% of the workout done, you can still check the box. You worked out, right? You still did something for yourself. But the more you do that, the less mental override that's needed mm -hmm. because the benefit is built into the practice. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's not hard to say, cold tub's 35, cool. Let's do it. I'll do three mm -hmm. minutes. Yep. Cold tub's 55. All right, great. This is Tasha's temperature. She likes that better, but I'll do 10 minutes because I still want the training effect. Yeah. And so I think of things like that and it's like where with enough of these things trickled in, we have an opportunity right now to really create habits that last. And if, if the, the basic idea behind if this is happening for us and not to us, right? Critical. If we look through that lens, what are the, the seeds that we plant now in the springtime that last the rest of our life, that shift the way we view the world, that shift the way we behave in the world, that shift the way we work, that shift the way we do everything on this planet, mm -hmm. that open us up to greater and greater awareness. And we have such a dope opportunity for that now because what do we have? More time on our hands. Yeah. More ability. When I've been, uh, I know we've both been doing private calls with all of our fit for service members. And, you know, one of the things that I've really seen is relationships are shifting dramatically. You know, like people are really reevaluating relationships because they're either, as we said earlier, spending all the time, you know, with their loved one, could it, maybe a spouse, but maybe just a girlfriend or whatever. You know, a lot of people are quarantining together and it's like, whoa <laughs> whoa and some some people are getting closer you know they're innovating new ways they're you know integrating new sex sexual practices and ideas and exploring and experimenting and cooking together and like finding things out and other people are like damn we're not really aligned i'm trying to meditate every day or i'm trying to do some uh, medicine journeys and my girl or my guy is just totally not into it and it's weird because i'm in my house doing that and they're like questioning me and i pop out and i just had a visitation from christ consciousness and they're like you know watching tiger king on fucking netflix <laughs> and it's just like damn this is not exactly working out so i have had a lot of people who've you know found themselves in a place where they're either moving farther or separate and i've been in that same position you know i've had a lot of my relationships transition shift and other ones come into accord and that's been one like really interesting aspect that will carry out and and also like recognizing the people who you prioritize talking to you mm -hmm. know like because now all of the so it's not just intimate relationships but all of like the the normal friends that you just like 
and we go out with the crew. It's Friday, you know, it's Friday night, it's Thursday night, it's dinner. Just just call the crew. It's the easy thing to do. Well, there is no crew anymore. (laughs) It's like you're choosing people one by one. And then you just start to figure out like, okay, like who are the important, who are the important connections in my life? Who are the people who are really supportive as my like soul family? And it's just kind of really clarifying so much of that. Yeah. All of these relationships are ways to know the self further. Right. And so if we are in a relationship that all of a sudden is not in alignment and it's pressingly in our face that it's not in alignment, we can try to implement practices together that can bring us closer and allow us to scale the mountain. Like, Hey, let's try this Wim Hof breathing together. We'll do three rounds of 30, no big deal. And if they feel the shift and they like it and gravitate towards it, then you can build on that. If the practice, whatever it is, is not well received, then that's a greater knowing of maybe we are really out of alignment here. Mm -hmm. But I think in any of those circumstances, you know, there, there is, I, I forget who I heard this from, but there is no wasted relationship. Because in every relationship, you have the ability to learn about yourself and you have the ability to learn about what you want. So what are you going to call in can come from the person that you're with, with patience and effort, or it can come from someone else entirely. But either way, it wasn't a waste of time. It wasn't a waste of investment in that person because it clarified what you want going forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's like our our buddy Boyd Vardy, you know, he Mm -hmm. says... There's no right or wrong track. There's either track or not track. And you need to go down not track to figure out it's not track. You know, and then that way you know where the track is. Like you're still exploring, you're still tracking, and that's what we're doing. We're tracking our the right accord for our life. And that's what all these practices and everything do, do. like what you try them, you track them, you track them to the point where you realize like, okay, this is a track. Or you track them to the point where it's like, yeah, I just don't think that's the track. Or maybe it's not the track for me now. Like think about, you know, like let's talk about some of these other things. And, and let's talk about like art and like the expression of ourselves as artists. Well, my poetry has been flourishing during this time. I've always known that that was a track for me, right? Um, I've tried some painting and some drawing. It doesn't really do it for me. But music does, you know, Mm -hmm. when I'm like playing the flute and exploring new melodies and like getting out of my head, like that's a track, you know? And so, but, and so like trying different things has, has been really beneficial to realize like, okay, you know, like maybe painting isn't my thing now, maybe it will be at some point. And it's a beautiful, like a beautiful practice, but I know that these ones are. So like, like if I can play music and if I can write some poetry every day, like I'm gonna feel fucking good no yeah. matter what. It's funny you mentioned that because that's that's kind of the the thing in any habit change. Like if you know you have to move some form of movement, well, what is it, right? And that reminds me of when Mark Bell was on the show and they were like, well, what's the best form of training? Is it bodybuilding, powerlifting, CrossFit? And he's like, it's the one you're not doing. <laughs> and that's true, right? Because mixing it up is what helps us grow. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the thing you love to do is the thing you stick to. Yeah. So if you hate fucking CrossFit, but you love riding your bike, guess what? Lean into that. Yeah. Ride your bike. And then yeah. if you can and you realize, well, maybe some form of strength and conditioning will actually help me bike better, now you have a why behind it. Right. Right. And I think of that too with the practices you were just talking about that not only are they beneficial in their soul medicine, you know, fucking anybody who's listened to great music knows it's tapping into something on a much deeper level than just, oh, hey, I enjoy that song. Like, yeah. no, it's, it's deeper than that. It's funny you say that you've gravitated towards the music because I'll pick up the flute and I'm like, man, this is just not calling me right now. <laughs> but I've been painting like a motherfucker. Right. And, I, and I'm even getting in my meditations, I will see shit to paint. Like I will see what the next painting is even before I finish the painting I'm on. Uh-huh. And, it, and, it's, and it's powerful shit that has meaning to me. Like I will know what that painting is when I look at it on the wall, especially on medicine. But <laughs> you know, yeah. you're like it's, it's something that matters. It's, it's on a... A deeper level of awareness right mm-hmm. but having those things that you you try them all right you try every practice of yoga to see which one you like you try every practice of working out to see which one you like and then for these creative outlets playing music you know uh some shit's expensive my hand pan was four grand there's other ones that are much cheaper that are fucking awesome yeah i got a right? i got a hand pan that's was probably 400 
Yeah. And it's still dope. It's dope as fuck. Yeah. I love it. That's what made me want to get a hand paint. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So things like that, like you, you, you get the instrument and, or, or any instruments you get, um, some painting supplies you need to just try them on for size. And with that, you'll find something that you want to lean into at this time. Mm-hmm. Right. It's kind of like you might be called to purchase a book, but you're not necessarily called to finish it. Mm-hmm. And then five years down the road, it's still in your library and you walk by it and you're like, Oh, now I'm supposed to read this. Dude, I had the it. fucking craziest experience with that. So I've had the pocket size Stephen Mitchell translation of the Tao Te Ching. And I've just had it. It's one of the books that I like keep on the toilet, you know, just in case like somebody wants to take a shit and read it. You know, it's like <laughs> it's, it's like that size. It's small. And I would flip through and I'd be like, yeah, cool. You know, like Taoism, whatever. Now I open it up and it's been probably eight years, 10 years since I've read you know, Lao Tzu's teachings and I read it and every single one just blows my fucking mind. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm ready for this now. Yeah. That just goes back to divine timing or, I mean, the high self timing if you're not into that shit, but yeah, it is, it is something that is, you know, it's perfect for you in the perfect moment of your life when you're ready and you're, you're able to receive like the, we had those on it posters of, uh, Dwayne Bang Ludwig with Boss Rutan. And it says, when the student is ready, the master appears, Mm -hmm. right? The old quote, samurai quote. And it's like, there's no question that's the case. And Mm -hmm. that's the case with your living library, which is a live conscious thing in my mind that will speak to you at the exact right moment for you to receive the message. That way you're not just thumbing through it saying, oh yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, like this does matter. There's a dope book that uh, Czech turned me on to called Finite and Infinite Games. Oh yeah. By James Cars. It's incredible. I listened to it on audible when I was in LA and I was like, damn, this book is special. And same thing. I was like, I walked by it and I have the the paperback. I was like, let me just open this. And it is, you know, he had a podcast on living 40 with Czech and Czech basically says like, it's very much seems like a Taoist parable, you know? And he's like, Oh, it is. And it was cool that Czech recognized that. But as I started reading it, you know, the each, each verse is numbered like the Tao Te Ching. And you mm-hmm. get through it and you're just like, oh, fuck. Like there's parts that I'll, I'll read uh, one section and I'll meditate on it for three fucking days. Like yeah. it sticks like that. You know, it's like that deep of downloads. Yeah. I want to go get this book. We're going to pause this podcast for a second because I want to get this mm-hmm. little, uh, little book I have and I want to read a, read a section from it. Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So this is verse one in, uh, in this translation, this pocket translation. And I would read this and I would be like, I don't fucking understand this. This doesn't make sense. So I'll read it. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Free from desire, you realize the mystery. Caught in desire, you see only the manifestations. Yet mystery and manifestations arise from the same source. This source is called darkness. Darkness within darkness. The gateway to all understanding. And so I was like, back then I was like, okay, what is that? But now like every single thing, I'm like, oh, shit. Like, I get it. Like that pregnant void that Joe Dispenza has been talking about. Like Mm -hmm. my own experience in the darkness. Like understanding the difference between the mystery and the manifestation and how they are same, but there's something, there's an undercurrent underneath there that Lao Tzu calls the Tao. Some might call it God. But, you know, Lao Tzu goes on to say that He describes it as something else. He says, this is verse four. The Tao is like a well used, but never used up. It is like the eternal void filled with infinite possibilities. It is hidden, but always present. I don't know who gave birth to it. It is older than God. And it's like, oh, damn. (laughs) Right? So like if we hadn't done all of our journey work, like we wouldn't understand that. Yeah. And then, but then now having done everything that we've done, you just feel this, this like sense 
of this thing that's like it's just always there it's always been there will never go away cannot it is older than god and then you just meditate on that for like what the fuck does that mean <laughs> you know how do you how do you understand that yeah. you know it's like and it's it's just so cool to go back to go back to something that you know you may have glossed over and i think that's one of the things you mentioned that you reread books a lot of times and that's a practice that i'd love to engage in and i've started with this one where it's like okay now let me go in here and see and i guarantee 10 years from now i'll go back to this i mean this text is thousands of years old not the translation but you know the the actual text itself and you'll go back and look at it and go like Ah, ha, 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 mm-hmm. ha, ha, ha. and then 10 years from now we'll have this podcast again me and you and i'll be like ah, ha, 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 yeah you that's know, a like, that's a beautiful it. point you're bringing up it's something that kimmy talked to me about in one of our sessions i'm sure she's brought it up to you uh she does uh while i'm at that and a lot of she's an energy worker but plain and simple what she was saying is um life moves in cycles but it moves like a spiral And so when the spiral comes back to the thing we've already worked on, whether that be childhood trauma or just an idea of, of what it means to be alive, what our existence is, why am I here? Some of the bigger questions, the reason we, we, we revisit that is because we do it down the road when our awareness has shifted Mm -hmm. and it, there are new teachings there. Every time we circle back, there's something more to grab from it. Mm -hmm. It's not old. There's no if you leave the ego out of it, cause in, and from personal experience, if I revisit something from the past and it's like, why the fuck is this coming up again? It's like, Oh, cause I can see it with new eyes mm-hmm. and because there's something still there to, to, to gain from, right. It's for me. So what do I gain from it with the new eyes? Yeah. And the same as with the books, the same yeah. as with any great teaching, as we revisit the great teaching, we've changed in the time that it took in between the original visitation of that teaching but the circling back allows us to draw more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was talking to you before, as we were just kind of hanging out before this, even watching movies that were old. Like I rewatched, I rewatched the Patriot from Mel Gibson. And I always liked that movie, but now seeing it, you know, with my reorientation to love and family, which is something that's kind of come in this deep calling and this deep knowing of like what that would feel like, you know, I watch that and it's like a whole new movie because I understand like the tension of him as a father, you know, even though I'm not a father yet, but I've, I'm in the, in the understanding of what I have a gnosis that is not experienced yet, but it's like, I, I feel that, you know, and then I think about the movie 300, which I've watched 10 times, you know, and, and obviously it's a touching moment when Leonidas leaves his wife, you know, it's like, wow, that's a touching moment. He leaves his wife to go, stand with 300 at the hot gates and hold the persian army knowing he's not going to come home but then like understanding what when you love somebody that much what that sacrifice entails it's like i re-see that in a whole different way and it's like fuck could i make that choice could i make that because i always thought like sure I'm I'd out. Make, I'm, I'd make that choice. Like, <laughs> goodbye, sweetheart. <laughs> like, I have my duty to fulfill, and I would like. And there's some kind of allure to the to the heroic martyrdom of a life spent in the service of some great cause. But then, when you like understand love, and you're like, holy shit, I have to leave my wife and my kid, and I'm not coming home. Damn damn like what courage what fucking courage to do that when when you have so much to lose yeah you know and it's it's funny that just you know even just shifts in perspective can take the same story and i think that's why stories are so powerful is you can see the story at the level you see it and then you see the story at a different level and it just hits you a different way and and you like you recognize that yeah, you're looking through a different lens. Mm-hmm. That's something Amit talks about in quantum spirituality as well as these, I mean, there's many archetypes, but he, he calls in the seven major archetypes of our soul's existence, what we're choosing to, to explore while we're here. And much like the five love languages, 
we have some higher ones that we're really aspiring to, but we're, we're working with all of them to some degree. And he gets into that from love to abundance to power. And he really shifts it. It's like, oh, power is an archetype. And when he talks about that, power in the shadow is I gain more power and take away others' power in doing so. Power in the light is as I gain more power, I empower more people. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, but of course, mm -hmm. of course, right? Abundance in the shadow is I gain more wealth and I take away from others as I do so. Mm -hmm. Abundance in the light is as I gain more wealth, I make other, all those around me more wealthy. Yeah. And more abundant in all forms. There's obviously many forms of abundance. But as he's illuminating this, it's like, oh, shit, yeah, we all do explore all these at different points in our life. And anytime we've, the medicine that I've been gaining in meditations and, and otherwise in medicine is that when we experience lack or scarcity or the shadow form of these things, it is only so the reflection of the other side is greater. It's if you have experienced a lack of power or feeling disempowered or unempowered, it's so you can know that slingshot back to the other side of that coin, right? So you have a deeper awareness around what it means to be in your power and what it means to be not in your power. Mm -hmm. And when you've experienced lack and eating spam growing up with mac and cheese to now having grass fed beef every fucking night and all, you know, the luxuries that I've acquired through help and through hard work, it's like, yeah, I get both sides of the coin now. So, and then I think that not only leads to compassion for others who aren't there yet, but a need to solve those problems for others too. How can I be of service? How can I be of service through the lens of abundance for others? How can I be of service to empower others by teaching them the ways they can get through the day better every mm. single day and improve upon their lives? And, you know, what's cool is you've come up for me in those. Obviously, you've been a big help in helping me with the abundance yeah, and the power, brother. And I see that too as like a, the why behind the podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, your podcast as well is it is empowering others. And yeah. what a fucking beautiful time for people to tune into that, to know like these are things we gain that go well beyond. Even if you don't read the books we recommend, there are pieces you can take from that to implement that are empowering. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you get to those different shifts and you have those different shifts in frequencies, that's when the highlights in relationships that are in discord, that are not in, in alignment really get highlighted right so um, paul selig you know a, a teacher to both of us and a spiritual master he talks about you know if you hold someone in judgment he, he uses the metaphor by putting them in the cave you put them in the cave of judgment and you put them in the judgment you cannot put them in the cave without going in the cave yourself right so anybody that you hold in darkness you hold yourself in darkness you know because because of the connection that we all have and the way that the mind works you cannot cast another in darkness without casting yourself in darkness so then you're around somebody who's really judgmental and really holding on to grievances and seeing only the darkness and only the shadow and only the judgment and it's like it's like nails on a chalkboard <laughs> yeah. you know you're like Whew. you know where it's like some years ago you might be like yeah you know that fucking person like fuck that you know like whatever they can go fuck themselves but then now you're around that and you're like ah i can't i can't you know like i i respect where you're i respect that you're at this level of understanding and that you're holding these judgments and i'm not judging you for that but being in that energy field is just like two magnets that are in in like the opposite or the same kind of pole that is just repelling each other you know they're not it's not supportive to where you're at and you can over you can overcome that by seeing them in a different way and you have to hold them in non-judgment as well but putting yourself in that situation continually where there's a discord of energy and a discord of the way that you want to live then you just ultimately have to recognize like whew, like uh, i love you but i have to i have to create some healthy boundary and space between that at this point because we just there's an energetic discord and it's un, it's uncomfortable and even if even if i can absolve myself of the judgment of what you're saying in judgment i still don't want to be around i choose not to be around yeah that level of judgment yeah love at a distance it's reminded me of a uh 
you know, Bear's young. And for a while, I couldn't have like a deep conversation with him because he's a fucking toddler. Yeah. You know, and then there, at some point, he started to shift. And it's always at night when we're laying in bed before he goes to sleep. He'll ask me questions and I answer. And we have Wachuma growing in the backyard, right? Completely legal, by the way. Mm-hmm. But uh, we have Wachuma growing in the backyard. And we were talking Except about. Except if you cut it and boil it, <laughs> yeah, then, then it becomes the vehicle. Throw your ass in jail. <laughs> yeah. Burn him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Listen, you can have this cactus in your yard, but if you cut it and you boil it and you drink it, we're throwing you in a cage. Yep. That makes Psilocybin sense. Psilocybin may grow in your backyard, but if you pick it, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, the conversation was around hate, and that's really one of the only words we say, we don't say that, right? And I don't tell them, hey, don't say that word, or you're not allowed to say that. There's none of that. It's just say, we as a family, we don't say that. And so other people may say, I hate this, I hate that, I hate this person, but we as a family don't say that word. And for some reason, he thought of the grandfather cactus, the Wachuma. And he goes, well, what does the Wachuma have pokies on it then? And I said, oh, that's a great question. The Wachuma has pokies on it. The grandfather cactus has pokies on it, not because it hates anyone. Those are just its boundaries because it's fragile Mm -hmm. and it knows to protect itself. So it says, hey, you can look at me, but don't touch me. Those are my boundaries, mm-hmm. right? And so it's very clear. I mean, in no doubt, Wachuma loves everyone. No right. fucking doubt it does. Anyone who's experienced that medicine knows right. Wachuma loves everyone. And that's not an airy-fairy, woo-woo thing to fucking say. Experience mm-hmm. it for yourself. But it does have its protection of. It does have some boundaries. And I think, you know, obviously you experienced that with the rose medicine. Yeah. That's critically important for people. So you're not bending over backwards to anything in life that no longer serves you. And a lot of these things, whether it be relationship or friends or any of or a job you have, they serve us to a point. But through our awakening, we see, oh, this no longer serves me. Well, what do you do at that point? You have to make changes because as you become aware, there's no going back to the unawareness. Mm-hmm. There's no, why did I take the red pill? Let me take the blue pill. Like you're fucking there. And the more you ignore it, the more it's in your face. Like mm-hmm. Paul Check was talking about on my podcast. Uh, if you try to have an out-of-body experience on medicine or without, and you haven't tended the needs of your body, your body's like a dog. It's going to keep barking at you. And you can't ignore that bark because it yeah. keeps getting louder, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. It's like it becomes an interesting it comes an interesting dance because it, on one level everybody can be your teacher and everybody can be your guru so you can put yourself in this uncomfortable position where somebody is really out of accord and then you can learn to hold your own energetic resonance you know despite that and in some ways strengthen it you know i think that's something that ted's talked to us about a lot ted decker is another one of our mentors you know it's like you can choose to put yourself in a relationship where it's your constant sadhana where it's your constant spiritual practice can i hold my frequency despite others pulling me out of that frequency and ramdas talks about that like he moved to new york intentionally because it was the hardest place for him to go and i think there is a virtue in that path but then there's also the virtue in like, okay, I could really put all my energy into like dealing with this challenging thing. And there's a time for that. And then there's also like, or maybe I'll just chill in Colorado for a little while, <laughs> you know, and like be around the places that are really supportive. And it's just a, it's a humble recognition of our own fragility. You know, it's like, I could do this, but I, it's going to be really hard. And I don't know if that challenge is the best way to use my is the best thing to you know propel me on my path of growth and it's it's that balance because you can't go all the way to comfort all the time avoiding challenge at all cost you can't also just be you know in a situation that's completely not helpful and not supportive where you have to devote an inordinate amount of energy to just handling that situation and that's where we just have to have that real kind of discretion about like all right when can i when can i leave myself in this uncomfortable position and just continue to work on myself through the resistance of this and when is it time to just let it go i've learned enough of this and now i'm going to find something that i'm going to learn a different way i'm going to learn through support i'm going to learn through the right community and the right tribe that's going to actually 
propel me faster and farther than learning through pain or learning through suffering or learning through the you know absolvement and forgiveness of those things that are out of accord and i think you have to just navigate that healthy balance between those two extremes yeah that's beautiful brother it's bringing up a couple things for me the um what ramdas talks about in becoming nobody you know when he when he breaks down buddhism and he says the the clinging to anything that brings happiness causes suffering but the aversion to anything that causes pain also causes suffering mm-hmm. right if you're i don't want to be depressed i don't like feeling this way you're feeding that right and it's it's the same line of polarity so you have to to have equanimity you can't have aversion to the negative and you can't have clinginess to the positive mm. but you also need to know how to navigate and one thing that selig talks about in his latest book beyond the known realization is as he stated early on you can learn through fear or you can learn through love both are great teachers paul check calls it the pain teacher he says it's an incredible teacher or you can learn without pain right <laughs> Right. So it's like, it's, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. And I, whether you're religious or not, I think what grace is, is the understanding that it can come with ease if we're willing to accept that and learn through love. And that's a, a really different model from what most of us grew up from, whether it be from the way you're parented or even how you were coached, right? Like the suck it up pussy, go harder. And, and, you know, (laughs) I'm reading, I'm reading Jocko's books uh, his kids books to bear and they're fantastic. They instill hard work and worth ethic. There is an element of Jocko in it because he's the fucking author. Right. And, and there, that's a beautiful method to work towards your goals. Discipline equals freedom. And at the same time, being is a huge piece that's not in there. Mm -hmm. Right. Like it's not always doing, there is a state of being that we can get to. And I think if we can manage those in balance, then we can get to, this is what I know is best for me right now. That Mm. intuition is loud and fucking clear. There's nothing standing in the way of it. There's no negotiation with the mind. There's no debate going on in the head because it's not in the head. It's known in the heart and the gut. And from there, your direction in life is much easier. The path becomes illuminated, right? And that track is easy to find. You have to have both. Like, that's why I think people, people are attracted to people who exemplify one extreme of that. You know, I think David Goggins' popularity. Oh, yeah. You know, Gary Vee? Yeah, David Goggins, Gary Vee. Like, very much in this kind of like, you just push through and you just go. And there's a time for that always. Like, and to be able to access that, like, oh, I'm tired. Oh, like, I don't want to do this. I'm going to keep motherfucking running. Oh, it's 120 degrees. Guess what? I'm going to run an extra 10 miles, you know, like, and like knowing that, and that's, that's something that we all will need to know and need to learn from and need to tap into, you know, and that's, and then there's also the part where, nah, I'm going to rest today. I'm going to not do anything. I'm going to decompress. Like you said, I'm going to lean into my yoga. I'm going to go to a deloading phase at this point so i'm not going to injure myself i'm not going to hurt myself i'm going to go within do the you know working within as paul check says versus and you really have to know both and you have to be able to tap into both you know and that's i was talking with you know with caitlin right now and she has a huge amount of work that uh and caitlin's one of our mutual friends another coach on ffs one of our best friends and you know, she's in a real grind and she has some family, you know, health stuff going on and it's a lot of challenges and she's got a lot of work. And she's like, I was like, Kate, this is the time for that Goggins mentality of like, you just keep going. You just go and you go and you go and you know, there's an end. There's a finish line in sight. It's like my friend Colin O'Brady who walked across Antarctica where it's only him and a 300 pound sled and ice and it's a 50 day journey to get across unassisted you know and you just wake up and you walk and you go and you keep fucking going until it's done and then at some point you know what you're not going to be in antarctica (laughs) you're going to be (laughs) chilling with your girl and you're going to be fucking relaxing and you're going to be watching you know watching netflix and cuddling and like having hot tea and like doing this other thing and like meditating and going through the whole thing both you got to know both to be like a really balanced human and to get the maximum out of this experience you can't you can't avoid one or the other and i think have the maximum experience in life 
Yeah. Yeah. It's like you explore, uh, Jen was talking about that on the, in the yoga session today, we explore the outer boundaries in all directions just so we can find where our center is. Mm -hmm. Right. And then that's a, that's a beautiful way to know that rather than just, let me just shoot right for the middle. It's like, okay, yeah, for sure. But if you spend time in the extremes, that's a way to know yourself as well. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can know the middle path much greater. Even I, it even brings up Burning Man. Let's take a let's take partying for an example, right? Like Burning Man is a motherfucking no rules, free for all party like you've never can possibly imagine. <laughs> and to like understand that limit and that kind of that extreme of what a party scenario is like is a beautiful thing to experience. You know? We're not going to run out of drugs. <laughs> yeah, there's that's a, no. <laughs> that's, a, that's a wonderful problem to be in. <laughs> yeah, and there's no, there's no bedtime. There's mm -hmm. music that's always playing, and it's always dope. And there's always something that you can do. And then you get to decide, like, okay, like what's my threshold? Like when do I need to have my quiet day in the RV? Like you get to find that through the extreme, and then you get to find that in your life, and then you will get to choose that. But if you never give yourself an experience where all the rules are shed, everything's open, everything's available, you don't ever know. You'll always be kind of craving more, you know? So you go to that that radical extreme and then you get it like, okay, I get I get what this is like. Or fuck it, like order the order fifty wings from Buffalo Wild Wings and just eat them all. Go for it. <laughs> Fucking do it. See how you feel. You know, like it's fine. You know, but then after that you'll be like yeah, that didn't feel so good. It 20 was, would have been all right. <laughs> 20 would have been fine. <laughs> you know, I would have been good with that. And um, I think that's the, that's the thing that people will often judge one, one behavior. But all of these things are the path because they find, they help us kind of, once you touch both sides, then you really know, you know those things. You know, like, all right, I know what it's like to, hardly sleep and be partying in the desert for five days and i know that it takes me three weeks to recover and come back to fucking normal and it was worth it but i'm not going to do that all the time you know I, I i know that i know that path and i know the other path i know the the darkness raw vegan isolation you know by myself alone in patagonia i know the i know these other isolation practices too and i'm like all right yeah that's good I'm not going to do that all the time either yeah. And then I think that's the, that's the, I think probably one of the biggest things that I would offer to people is like, know the extremes. Like you want to, you want to know what it feels like to be keto, like really do it. Don't just like have a few keto cookies and then go on and eat your spaghetti. Like go for it. Like feel it, like feel what nutritional ketosis feels like, feel what it feels like to have organ meat and be carnivore for a while feel what it feels like to be vegan for a while feel what it feels like to and then find like what your balance is yeah. which i think we you know we talk about and own the day a lot which is a mostly ketogenic kind of start to the day and adding in some carbohydrate at night and that's kind of probably the middle path for most people yeah but you appreciate it when you understand like all right here's what it feels like when i go all the way i got tons of energy but I don't sleep as good and like I'm not going to sustain that forever. And then here's this other path that's just eating all carbohydrates and I'm exhausted all the time and I'm taking naps and I'm drinking coffee and I can hardly stay awake. And I'm like, well, that's not it either. All right. So let me find the, let me find the thing that's going to be the most supportive for me usually. Yeah. Yeah. Nine days out of 10, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And have your cake and eat it too. You know, mm -hmm. like I, I, both of us have similar genetics when we did our DNA report and that was something that came up. Both have a prerequisite for type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. Both have a prerequisite for, for, uh, being obese. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, nope, we, we ain't going there. That ain't gonna happen. <laughs> nope. But you know, you do, you do something like Rob Wolf's seven day carb tests and there's quite a few carbohydrates that are inflammatory to me. There's quite a few that the postprandial glucose is high. Doesn't mean I'm never going to have white rice. If I go to fucking sushi, I'm eating sushi. I'm having white rice. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. I'm not just going to stick to sashimi. I want rolls. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so what can I do to manage that better? Oh, I'll work out that day. Yeah. I'll create a carb deficiency by not having carbohydrates during the day. So when I eat them at night, it's feeding my liver and my muscle. Right. But those, 
those things are learned through the experience of no carbohydrates Mm -hmm. and then all the carbohydrates and then where's it in between what time of day all those things matter you know but it is that it's it's I think with most things in life, it's just getting curious about it. Yeah. Like, oh, hey, I want to know more about this thing, right? And so then let me try it, right? Um, it's Bruce Lee, and this goes against kind of the do-do-do model, but not from his lens. If you understand it, it's, you know, it's not enough to know we must do, right? So you read a book, you figure out some things. Where's the practice, right? Where do you start to implement that? You do 30 grams of mushrooms, what changed your life after that? Did you actually change it or did you have revelations that didn't be made manifest, right? You have to start to put things into your daily calendar that shift you in a way where you look back at the 30 gram dose or the darkness retreat or whatever the case is. And you go, Oh, that actually did change X, Y, and Z in my life. Here's the evidence of it. Here's how I live differently. And it doesn't have to be darkness or 30 grams. It can be a gram and it could be a 24 hour fast or whatever, you know, it could be sitting in a cave for a day. Mm. It could be any of those practices, but what actually changes going forward is what makes the difference. Yeah. I think about it in terms of relationship too, because I'm coming off a six year, you know, wildly polyamorous, you know, relationship. Pretty wild. Pretty wild. (laughs) And, and that taught me so much about myself, put me through heaven and hell to a to such a strong degree that now I'm so clear that what I'm craving is like a sacred union with a person. And I don't ascribe to the boundaries and the and the kind of ideas of is this monogamy or not monogamy, whatever. Like it doesn't matter. But this idea of this kind of love free for all for me is like, yeah, I tried that. And perhaps the circumstances of that particular situation could be tweaked and it could be an, an accretive path that i would potentially explore in the future but i did that i've learned my things and now this i know what my next track is my next track is a union with a person that's so sacred and like so important that i'm not drawn to that anymore but would i have ever gotten to that if i didn't experience the other nope (laughs) <laughs> no, not at all. I would have always been like wondering, like, what would it have been You'd have like? Question marks above your head, like Mario <laughs> Yeah, <Kart>. exactly. And <laughs> Everywhere that's, you go. That's what you don't want. You know, you don't want to have all of those question marks that haunt you. You know, they will fucking haunt you if you haven't really gone out and like checked it out. Now, there's some things that you maybe don't want to experience. Like, maybe you don't want to try heroin for a couple of weeks. It's a bit probably risky. A good idea. It's a bit maybe, risky. Maybe you don't want to rip the meth pipe. <laughs> yeah, you probably <laughs> don't want to rip the meth pipe. You know, like some things you just got to let go. And you got to be like, look, I have respect for this thing because it's so gnarly that even though it is an experience and I'm a human being and I and I like to experience I'm never going to shoot up hair. I'm never going to, you're never going to see me with a fucking rubber band around my arm (laughs) and heating up a spoon. And if you do, (laughs) please just slap the fuck out of me because it's a bad idea. You know what I mean? Granted though, like I have an antique opium pipe and if somehow (laughs) somebody just kind of loaded that up and my 200 year old opium dragon pipe was loaded, I would be like, yeah, fuck it. I'll, I'll take a puff. You know, like I'll hit that thing once and see, you know, see what that's like. And, and that's, and that may sound reckless and that may sound stupid and it may sound, but I think for me, it's just, everybody has to decide where their boundaries are. And I'm so, I do so much crave the knowledge of experience, but also have the respect. So while heroin is in the never category, opium would be in the yeah, I'd try that shit. Dude, that's, that's pulling up a couple of memories from college where I, I smoked black tar once out of a bong and red rock opium. <laughs> and they were, it was fucking amazing. Now, keep in mind, I'm a person who, if I, you know this, if I have too much kratom, I'll throw up. My head will yeah. spin. I snorted an Oxycontin once and threw up for hours. Like mm-hmm. I'm very low tolerance to that. Psychedelics, different ball game, but very low tolerance to any opiates. And just having like one hit of each from a bong, there was really no side effects and I'm not condoning like, all right, everybody, let's go try black tar (laughs) fucking opium or red rock. It's like, no, but I think it's important to what you're talking about here on the bigger picture is 
what is the never? What is the gray category? You know, and then what is the yes? Yeah. Right. And then figuring that out for yourself and then playing with those boundaries, you know, not playing with the never, but playing within the boundaries of maybe, mm. you know, and, and that answers a lot of questions for you. You yeah. know, it's a way to know yourself even further. I, I think about that with cocaine, like 12 years ago, you know, there was about a year stretch where probably during that year stretch, I would take a bump of Coke, maybe I probably probably five, six times in my life. And every single time it was fun for fun for an hour or two. And then I reevaluated my life in a deep, dark depression on the come down of that for days afterwards. And even though I've been in a lot of wild parties and a lot of situations where in every bathroom was an opportunity <laughs> and even the right sometimes right on the fucking counter, you know, there's these things where I'm like, nah, it's just not for me. You know, that's like that thing's not for same with Adderall. I did Adderall once and I was like up for two days and I was like, well, that's out, <laughs> you know, like this is kind of what meth feels like. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> that, that's out, you know, and but it, do I do I re regret that? No, I don't regret that. You know, I knew that. However, some people, you know, that can be a really slippery thing where you like you take it and somehow you get kind of hooked by it. And then those things can be addictive. And then you got to really be mindful that this thing that you think might be a maybe that you're just trying that maybe can then very quickly compel you into an addiction that becomes a problem. It becomes a dependency. Yeah. And that's like, that's a big issue, whether it's an opiate or whether it's a stimulant or whether it's whatever. And so the process of checking yourself by like fasting, you know, even both of us, we love our tobacco, but like, it's good every once in a while to not bring the can of snooze where we go and be like, can I Just do this? Turn the cameras away from my can of snooze that's on the table right now. <laughs> I mean, I got my little thing I've been <laughs> sucking on right here. Right. But like, there's been periods where I just need to, I need to know that I can go a couple days without it because otherwise I'm not using it. It's using me. Yeah. You know, it's same with alcohol, same with coffee. And it's like, these things are not things that I'm going to probably disengage from forever, but you gotta, you gotta have, you gotta have the humility. It's really about the humility to know and the, and the willingness to say like, fuck, I got addicted, you know, like, here I am. Yeah. What is, is there dependency? Is there right? dependency? You can't figure that out without breaks, mm -hmm. you know? And that's a, a lot of questions we get on psychedelics is how often, when I'm really, I'm really gaining so much from it. I want to go back and it's like, okay, yes, you're gaining a lot. If I gain, if I read a, a great book and I gain a lot of wisdom from it and I'm starting to practice it, the intellect can be just as hungry for more information as any other part of the body. I fucking have a deadlift PR. Now I want to deadlift more. I'm, I'm chasing that thing. Well, is the mind chasing something is, is there a part of you that gains a lot from the one ceremony that craves more, more, more. And can you sit with that and say, Oh, I see what's going on here. There is something that can't be filled. There is a thing that always wants more. Mm -hmm. Can I shift from that? And if I take a break and give it space, will it then be more valuable when I come back? The answer is usually yes, mm -hmm. right? You give space to the medicine, whatever it is, you're going to come back to it and it's going to have its full force. You start stacking these things pretty close proximity and they start to lose their luster. I mean, no different than coffee. You look at the relationship with coffee. I went to decaf for a month, circled back to full gas and I have a cup of coffee and I'm fucking primed. It's like my first cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. You go on a dieta for ayahuasca and come off coffee and come back on. And the first cup of decaf does that, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that it is really important that you push pause on whatever the implement, even working out. Like right now, like I mentioned in the beginning of this, like I'm going to take a week off and just focus on flexibility and yoga and mindfulness and see where that takes me. Mm -hmm. And maybe that seeds to a daily practice of yoga with an afternoon practice of, of working out a few days a week, you yeah. know? So to bring this back to what we were originally talking about, which is, you know, owning the day in the quarantine, I think what we've expressed is this is own the day really is the middle path that I think most people, if they want to know what the middle path is, like where you're in harmony with all of these different elements, like, all right, this is it. Like we put, 350 clinical citations we found the way that typically the best day is going to be and it has a workout and it has connection with your family it has playing music it has great sex yeah great sex it has the the 
proper diet techniques. It has the morning mineral cocktail. It has the cold therapy. It has all of the things that you can put into a day that you're going to finish that day and feel really good. But there's also now the freedom to explore, like really like lean into one more than the other, lean into the other more than the other. And then maybe we all end up back in the own the day kind of framework. But to just only live that your whole life, I don't think you'll ever really appreciate what that kind of middle path really is, you know, until you kind of push the boundaries and just see and give and take and move and, and balance yourself. Yeah, brother. And even, you know, just thinking on that in terms of relationships, since you brought it up last, you had to know what all these other tools were so there wouldn't be question marks left for the divine union, right? Uh, in many ways, I'm in the same boat. You know, I didn't explore polyamory to the degree that, that you did, but I certainly went deep quick. And, you know, now I'm, I'm in a space where I, Christian's in. As long as he's in, he's in. But I'm not looking for another girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I have my relationship, mm -hmm. you know, and that matters most to me. And I also have the, the, with the lack of time of having multiple partners to understand, oh, how I choose to spend my time does matter, right? So if there is something in your life, relationship or otherwise, multiple partners or otherwise, that takes up a significant amount of time and bandwidth, once that's freed, what do you do now? And we're all in that space right now. What do I do now with all this fucking free time? Mm -hmm. We get to explore. We get to learn. You know. So what things do we want to seed? And it's yeah. all right here, brother. Yeah. And then what are the things that have been withheld that we're going to really appreciate? Yeah. Concerts, you know, like dinner parties, you know, going out and booking that table for eight at your favorite restaurant and sharing a bottle of wine and telling stories and hanging out. And like, you can take that shit for granted. It's always been fun, but man, is that going to be good after yeah. this? This is a fast. This is a fast from social interaction. This is a fast from hugging a stranger. This is a fast from, you know, going to these larger gatherings. And I, it's my belief that by the very nature of any fast, we're all going to come out of this with a much greater appreciation. You know, like if we get to go see Nako at Red Rocks, that would have been a cool experience three months ago. But two months from now, that's going to be like, whoa. Yeah. This is fucking special. Oh, you yeah, know, brother. Well, it's uh it's a challenging time, but it's a beautiful time, you know, and I think that's the that's the case. And so much sympathy and and compassion for everybody who's really, you know, in the in the thick of it, whether you're a healthcare professional who's out there really working extra shifts and working so hard, or whether you're someone who's been laid off because the company can't work anymore and you have to file for unemployment and figure stuff out there's a lot of hard hard things that are going on and you know tons of compassion for that but also tons of confidence and hope for all of the things that are unraveling and unwinding and becoming clear because of the gift of this pause that the whole world's been on like bink pause and yeah. now we get to see it all yeah and looking through that lens of it's it is for us yeah you know even in all the pain i've i've had uh a couple friends parents who have died you know on ventilators i've had uh, a bunch of friends lose their jobs you know mm -hmm. and it's it's it hasn't affected me directly but it has affected me and we're all affected in some way or another no question about it so, you know, like Eisenstein talks about in the coronation, which mm -hmm. is one of the best articles ever written in all this, True. what are we going to do going forward? You know, how do we tie these back? It's not going to go back the way it was. It's going to be something new, right? I don't, there's so much that's unknown about this right now, right? That we'll be able to look in hindsight and say, that was true. That wasn't true. Or we overdid it here. We underdid it there. Those kind of things. But through all this, it's the decisions we make going forward or how we figure out how to make this more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Mm -hmm. Well, here's to that. Awesome, brother. I love you, brother. I'm glad I to be you. in this whole fucking journey with you, man. Fuck to, yeah. the, to the very fucking end. Side by side till the end, brother. To the end. I love you guys so much. Oh, Kyle, so 
Kyle Kingsbury podcast. You yep. got a new Instagram. Yep. With living Tosh, with the Kingsbury's. Up, living with the Kingsbury's. I jumped off the gram for a month. It was good for me to have my social detox, but I think in times like this, it's uh, it's important to have a voice and that through all the perils of social media is the very easiest way to connect to people. So we're answering a lot of questions there. We'll be doing lives there and uh, yeah, onward and upward. Onward and upward. Love you, brother. I love you, brother. Thanks, everybody. Peace. So there's a few things that I keep in my medicine bag at all times. And I've been prone to having sore throats since I was a kid. Like, I remember getting strep throat when I was younger. I remember getting all kinds of things happening where there'd be nasal drainage and my throat would be sore. Or when I've been an adult, just talking a bunch, doing a bunch of podcasts or anything, having a sore throat is like an issue or a scratchy throat or any kind of irritated throat. And I have not found a single better thing in my entire life to use than the Beekeepers Naturals Propolis Throat Spray. Now, Propolis is great for you to begin with, but it just works. Like, nothing feels better for your throat. And that doesn't matter if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're just feeling that kind of irritation in your throat and you take a swig of water and then spray this in your throat. Or if you just want to clear out your voice so that you can perform in any way that you want. There's literally nothing better than this. So it just goes with me everywhere. Just in case I need it, I know I want to have this in my medicine bag. So it's simple. You just open your mouth, spray it in four times, and it just soothes and coats the throat. Like, I don't know what the bees are doing, but they're making some magic shit. And I just really appreciate Beekeepers Naturals producing the highest quality products that they possibly can from the bees so that the bees can help support us. And then hopefully we stop fucking around with the Earth's environment and we can help those bees out too. So it becomes a symbiotic relationship, bees and us and bees. And we're not just stinging each other, literally and metaphorically. So check it out. Go to beekeepersnaturals.com slash Aubrey, save 15%. And make sure you just have this in your medicine bag. It's clutch. It's crucial. And they got a bunch of other cool shit too. So beekeepersnaturals.com slash Aubrey. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe. Also, share with any friend that you think might benefit from it. And lastly, go to aubreymarcus.com, sign up for my newsletter diary, and you won't miss a thing.